Let's see how people started dancing in the Middle Ages. And how is it that this disease hasn't come back? Quite interesting. Ah, the Dancing Mania, Chapter 1. The Dancing Mania in Germany and the Netherlands. Section 1, St. John's Dance. The effects of the Black Death had not yet subsided, and the graves of millions of its victims were scarcely closed, when a strange delusion arose in Germany, which took possession of the minds of men, and in spite of the divinity of our nature, hurried away body and soul into the magic circle of hellish superstition. It is a convulsion which, in the most extraordinary manner, infuriated the human frame and excited the astonishment of contemporaries for more than two centuries, since which time it has never reappeared. It was called the Dance of St. John or of St. Vitus on account of the Bahantic leaps by which it was characterized and which gave to those affected, whilst performing their wild dance and screaming and foaming with fury, all the appearance of persons possessed. It did not remain confined to particular localities, but was propagated by the sight of the sufferers, like a demonical epidemic over the whole of Germany and the near neighboring countries to the northwest which were already prepared for its reception by the prevailing opinions of the times. <laughs> so, early as the year 1374, assemblages of men and women were seen at all Chapelle, who had come out of Germany and who, united by one common delusion, exhibited to the public both in the streets and in the churches the following stage spectacle. They form circles hand in hand, and appearing to have lost all control over their senses, continued dancing, regardless of the bystanders, for hours together in wild delirium, until at length they fell to the ground in a state of exhaustion. They then complained of extreme oppression, and groaned as if in the agonies of death, until they were swathed in cloths, bound tightly around their waists, upon which they again recovered and remained free from complaint until the next attack. This practice of swathing was reported, resorted to on account of the tympany which followed these spasmodic ravings. But the bystanders frequently relieved patients in a less artificial manner by thumping and trampling upon the parts affected. While dancing, they neither saw nor heard, being insensible to external impressions through the senses, but were haunted by visions, their fancies conjuring up spirits whose names they shrieked out and some of them afterwards asserted that they felt as if they had been immersed into a stream of blood, which obliged them to leap so high. Others, during the paroxysms, saw the heavens open and the Saviour enthralled with the Virgin Mary, according as the religious notions of the age were strangely and variously reflected in their imaginations. <laughs> Spooky. Where the disease was completely developed, the attack commenced with epileptic convulsions. These affected fell to the ground senseless, panting and laboring for breath. They foamed at the mouth, and suddenly spinning up 
began their dance amidst strange contortions, yet the melody doubtless made its appearance very variously, and was modified by temporarity and local circumstances, whereof non-medical contemporaries but imperfectly noted the essential particulars, accustomed as they were to confront their observations of natural events with their notions of the world of spirits. It was but a few months ere that this demonical disease had spread from all La Chapelle, where it appeared in June, over the neighboring Netherlands. In Liège, Utrecht, Torgue, and many other towns of Belgium, the dancers appeared with garlands in their hair and their waists grid with cloth, that they might, as soon as the paroxysm was over, receive immediate relief on the attack of the tympani. This bandage was, by the insertion of a stick, easily twisted tight. Many, however, obtained more relief with kicks and blows, which they found numbers of persons ready to administer. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Come here, I'll punch you, I'll punch you, you dancing. For wherever the dancers appeared, the people assembled in crowds to gratify their curiosity with a frightful spectacle. At length, the increasing number of the affected excited no less anxiety than the attention that was paid to them. In towns and in villages they took possession of the religious houses, processions were everywhere instituted on their account, and masses were said and hymns were sung, while the disease itself of the demonical origin of which no one entertained the least doubt, excited everywhere astonishment and horror. In Liège the priests had recourse to exorcisms, and endeavoured, by every means in their power, to allay an evil which threatened so much danger to themselves. For the possessed assembling in multitudes frequently poured forth imprecations against them and uh, menaced their destruction. They intimidated the people also to such a degree that there was an express ordinance issued that no one should make any but square-toed shoes. <laughs> what? Because these fanatics had manifested a morbid dislike to the pointed shoes which had come into fashion immediately after the great mortality, in 1350. They were still more irritated at the sight of red colors, the influence of which on the discovered nerves might lead us to imagine an extraordinary accordance between this spasmodic malady and the condition of infuriated animals. But in the St. John's dancers this excitement was probably connected with apparitions consequent upon their convulsions. So I guess they hate red, sh red square shoes or something? <laughs> there were likewise some of them who were unable to endure the sight of persons weeping. The clergy seemed to become daily more and more confirmed in their belief that those who were affected were a kind of sectarians, and on this account they hastened their exorcisms as much as possible in order that the evil might not spring amongst the higher classes, for hereto scarcely any but the poor had been attacked, and a few people of respectability around the laity and clergy, who were to be found amongst them, were persons whose natural frivolity was unable to withstand the excitement of novelty, even though it proceeded from a demonical influence. Some of the affected had indeed themselves declared, when under the influence of the priestly forms of exorcisms, that if the demons had been allowed only a few weeks more, they would have entered the bodies of the nobility and princes, and through these had destroyed the clergy. Assertions of this sort, which those possessed uttered whilst in a state which may be compared with that of magnetic sleep, obtained general belief, and passed from mouth to mouth with wonderful additions. 
the priesthood were on this account so much the more zealous in their endeavours to anticipate every dangerous excitement of the people, as if the existing order of things could have been seriously threatened by such incoherent ravings. Their ex exertions were effectual, for exorcisms was a powerful remedy in the 14th century. Or it might perhaps be that this mild infatuation terminated in consequence of the exhaustion which naturally ensued from it. At all events, in the course of ten or eleven months, the St. John's dancers were no longer to be found in any cities of Belgium. The evil, however, was too deeply rooted to give away altogether to such feeble attacks. Mm. A few months after this dancing malady had made its appearance at Eau de Chapelle, it broke out at Cologne. There the number of those possessed amounted to more than five hundred, and about the same time at Metz, the streets of which place are said to have been filled with eleven hundred dancers. Peasants left their ploughs, mechanics their workshops, housewives their domestic duties, to join the wild reveries, and this rich commercial city became the scene of the most ruinous disorder. Secret desires were excited, and too often found opportunities for wild enjoyment, and numerous beggars, simulated by vice and misery, availed themselves of this new complaint to gain a temporary livelihood. Girls and boys quitted their parents and servants their masters to amuse themselves at the dancers and those possessed, and greedily imbibed the poison of mental infection. Mm, that's kind of interesting. Mental infection. Um, above, a hundred unmarried women were seen raving about in consecrated and unconsecrated places, and the consequences were soon perceived. Gangs of idle vagabonds who understood how to imitate to life the gestures and convulsions of these really affected, roved about the place to place seeking maintenance and adventures. And thus, whenever they went spreading this disgusting spasmodic disease like a plague, for in maladies of this kind the susceptible are infected as easily by the appearance as by the reality. At last it was found necessary to drive away these mischievous guests, who were equally inaccessible to exorcisms of the priests and the remedies of the physicians. It was not, however, until after four months that the Ruish cities were able to suppress these impostors which had so alarmingly increased the original evil. In the meantime, when once called into existence, the plague crept on and found abundant food in the tone of thought which prevailed in the 14th and 15th centuries, and even throughout the 16th and 17th, causing a permanent disorder of mind and exhibiting in these cities to those inhabitants in was a novelty, scenes as strange as they were detestable. Mm. Interesting. Ah, section 2. St. Vitus's Dance Strasbourg was visited by the Dancing Plague in the year 1418, and the same infatuation existed amongst the people there as in the towns of Belgium and the Lower Rhine. Many who were seized at the sight of these affected excited attention at the first of their confused and absurd behaviours, and then by their constantly following the swarms of dancers. These were seen day and night passing through the streets, accompanied by musicians, playing on bagpipes, and by innumerable spectators attracted by curiosity, to which were added anxious parents and relations, who came to look after those monks the misguided multitude who belonged to their respective families. Imposture and uh, profligacy. Profligacy? What? Mm. 
I have to look up this one. Profligacy. Profligacy, okay. Reckless, extravagant, and wasteful in the use of resources. Okay. Profligacy. Profligacy. Imposture and profligacy played their part in this city also, but a morbid delusion itself seemed to have predominated. On this account, religion could only bring provisional aid, and therefore the town council benevolently took an interest in the afflicted. They divided them into separate parties, which they appointed responsible superintendents to protect them from harm, and perhaps also to restrain their tolerance. They were thus conducted on foot and in carriages to the chapels of St. Vitus near Zabern and uh, uh, Rotestein, where priests were in attendance to work upon their misguided minds by masses and other religious ceremonies. After divine worship was completed, they were led in solemn procession to the altar, where they made some small offering of alms and were cured of this lamentable aberration. It is worthy of observation at all events that the dancing mania did not recommence at the altars of the saint, and that from him alone assistance was implored, and though his miraculous interposition a cure was expected which was beyond the reach of human skill. The personal history of St. Vitus is by no means unimportant in this matter. He was a Sicilian youth who, together with Modestus and uh, Crescestia, um, okay, suffered martyrdom at the time of the persecution of the Christians under Diocletian in the year 1303. Oh no, uh, 303. <laughs> much, much earlier. The legends respecting him are obscure, and would certainly have been passed over without notice among the innumerable apocryphal martyrs of the first centuries, had not the transfer of his body to St. Denis, and hence in the year 836 to Covey, raised him to a higher rank. From this time forth, it may be supposed that many miracles were manifested at this new sepulchre, which were of essential service in confirming the Roman faith amongst the Germans, and St. Vitus was soon ranked among the fourteen saintly helpers, a uh, Norfolk helper or Aprof Keller. Helper, I guess, in German. His altars were multiplied, and the people had recourse to them in all kinds of distresses, and revered him as a powerful intercessor. As the worship of these saints was, however, at that time, stripped of all historical connections, which were purposely obliterated by the priesthood, a legend was invented at the beginning of the 15th century, or perhaps even so early as the 14th, that St. Vitus had, just before he bent his neck to the sword, prayed to God that he might protect from the dancing mania all those who should solemnize the day of his commemoration, <laughs> and fast upon its eve, and that thereupon a voice from heaven was heard, saying, Vitus, thy prayer is accepted. Thus St. Vitus became the patron saint of those affected, with the dancing plague, as St. Martin of Tours was, at the time, the succorer of persons in smallpox, and St. Antonius of those suffering under the hellish fire, as was St. Margaret, was the Juno Lucia of puerperal women. Okay, what is the hell you think this is? 
Puebla. Puebla. Ah, relating to the period of the six weeks after childbirth, during which the mother's reproductive organs return to their original non-pregnant condition. Ah, okay, so it's... She's helping with women after their birth. Very well. Okay, section 3. Causes. The connection which John the Baptist had with the dancing mania of the 14th century was a totally different character. He was originally far from being a protected saint of those who were attacked, or one who would be likely to be given them a relief from a malady considered as the work of the devil. On the contrary, the manner in which he was worshipped afforded an important and very evident cause for its development. From the remotest periods, perhaps even so far back as the 4th century, St. John's Day was solemnized, with all sorts of strange and rude customs, of which the originally mystical meaning was variously disfigured amongst different nations by superadded relics of heathenism. Thus, Germans transferred to the festival of St. John's Day an ancient heathen usage, the kindling of uh, Nodfir, and the belief subsists even to the present day that people and animals that have been leaped through these flames or their smoke are protected for a whole year from fevers and other diseases, as if by a kind of baptism of fire. Bacchanalian dancers, which have originated in similar causes among all the rude nations on earth, the wild extravagances of heathen imagination, were the constant accompaniments of this half-heathen, half-Christian festival. At the period of which we are treating, however, the Germans were not the only people who gave way to the Ebob Ebulitians? <laughs> the hell is that word? Abolition. Abolition? The act of bubbling. Oh, like a bullion. Okay. Gave way to the abolition of fanaticism in keeping the festival of Saint John the Baptist. Similar customs were also to be found amongst the nation of southern Europe and of Asia, and it is more than probable that the Greeks transferred to the festival of Saint John the Baptist, who is also held in high esteem among the Mohammedans, a part of their Bacchanalian mysteries and absurdity of a kind which is but too frequently met with in human affairs. How far a remembrance of the history of St. John's death may have had a influence on this occasion, we would have learned theologists to decide. It is only of importance here to add that in Abyssinia, a country entirely separated from Europe, where Christianity has maintained itself in its primeval simplicity against the Mohammedism, John is in this day worshipped as a protective saint of those who are attacked with the dancing malady. In these fragments, the dominion of mysticism and superstition, historical connection is not to be found. Then we observe, however, that the first dancers in all the chapelle appeared in July and with St. John's name in their mouth, the conjecture is possible that the wild reveres of St. John's Day, uh, A.D. 1374, gave rise to this mental plague, which henceforth has visited so many thousands with incurable aberration of mind and disgusting distortions of body. Ah, so this guy says that um, they were partying during St. John's and uh, that sort of became a mental disease which spread 
amongst people. <laughs> like a mental virus. This is rendered so much the more probable because some months previous the districts in the neighboring of Rhine and Maine had met with great disasters. So early as February, both these rivers have overflowed their banks to a great extent. The walls of the town of Cologne, on the side next to the Rhine, had fallen down, and a great many villages had been reduced to the most utmost distress. To this was added the miserable condition of the western and southern Germany. Neither law nor edict could surpass the incessant feuds of the barons, and in Franconia especially, the ancient times of club law appeared to be revived. Security of property there was none, arbitrary will everywhere prevailed. Corruptions of morals and rude power rarely met with even a feeble opposition, whence it arose that the cruel but lucrative persecutions of the Jews were in many places still practiced through the whole of this country with their wanton ferocity. Thus, throughout the western part of Germany, and especially in the districts bordering on the Rhine, there was a wretched and oppressed populace, and if we take into consideration that amongst their numerous bands many wandered about, those consequences were tormented with the recollection of the crimes which they had committed during the prevalence of the Black Plague. We shall comprehend how their despair sought relief in the intoxication of an artificial delirium. There is hence good ground for supporting that the frantic celebration of the festival of St. John in 1374 only served to bring to a crisis a malady which had been long impending. We must take into account the unusual excitement of men's minds and the consequences of wretchedness and want. The bowels, which in many were debilitated by hunger and bad food, were precisely the parts which, in most cases, were attacked with excruciating pain and the tympanic state of intestines, points out to the intelligent physician an origin of the disorder which is well worth consideration. <laughs> So, also hunger played, uh, played a role, eh? More ancient dancing plagues. The dancing mania of the year 1374 was in fact no new disease, but a phenomenon well known in the Middle Ages of which many wondrous stories were traditionally current amongst the people. In the year 1237, onwards of hundred children were said to have been seized with this disease at Erfurt, and to have proceeded dancing and jumping along the road to Arnstadt. Then, when they arrived at that place, they fell exhausted to the ground, and according to an account of the old uh, chronicle, many of them, after they were taken home by their parents, died and the rest remained afflicted to the end of their days with a permanent tremor. Another occurrence was related to have taken place on the Moncel Bridge at Utrecht on the 17th day of June, 1278, when two hundred fanatics began to dance and would not desist until a priest passed who was carrying the host to a person who was sick, upon which, as if in punishment to their crime, the bridge gave away, and they all drowned. A similar event also occurred so early as the year 1027, near the Covent Church of Kolbig, not far from Brandenburg, according to an oft-repeated tradition, eighteen peasants, some of which uh, whose names are still preserved, are said to have disturbed divine service on Christmas Eve 
by dancing and brawling in the churchyard. Whereupon the priest, Ruperk, <laughs> uh, Ruprecht, maybe, Ruprecht, uh, whereupon the priest, Ruprecht, inflicted a curse upon them that they should dance and scream for a whole year without ceasing. This curse is stated to have been completely fulfilled, so that the unfortunate sufferers at length sank knee-deep into the earth and remained the whole time without nourishment until they were finally released by intercessions of two pious bishops. It is said that upon this they fell into a deep sleep, which lasted three days, and that four of them died, the rest continuing to suffer all their lives from a trembling of their limbs. It is not worthwhile to separate what may have been true and what the addition of crafty priests in this strangely distorted story. It is sufficient that it is believed and related with astonishment and horror throughout the Middle Ages, so that when there was uh, any exciting cause for this delirious raving, the wild rage of dancing, it failed not to produce its effects upon men whose thoughts were given up to a belief in wonders and apparitions. This disposition of mind, altogether so peculiar to the Middle Ages, and which happily for mankind was yielded to an improved state of civilization, and the diffusion of popular instruction accounts for the origin of long duration of this extraordinary mental disorder. The good sense of the people recoiled with horror and aversion from this heavy plague which, whenever marvellous persons wished to curse their bitter enemies and adversaries, was long after used as a malediction. Awesome. May you dance to death. <laughs> May you party on forever, dude. <laughs> the indignation was also that was felt by the people at large against the immortality of the age was proved by their ascribing this frightful affliction to the inefficiency of baptism by unchaste priests, as if innocent children were doomed to atone in after years for this desecration of the sacred administered by unholy hands. We have already mentioned that the perils of priests in the Netherlands occurred from this belief. They now indeed endeavoured to hasten their uh, reconciliation with the irritated and at this time very degenerate people by exorcisms, which with some procured them greater respect than ever, because they thus visibly restored thousands of those who were afflicted. Jesus, thousands of exorcisms! Awesome! In general, however, there prevailed a want of confidence in their efficiency, and when the sacred rites had a little power in arresting the progress of this deeply rooted malady, as the prayers and holy services subsequently had at the altars of the greatly revered martyrs St. Vitus, they may therefore ascribe it to accident merely, and to a certain aversion to this demonical disease, which seemed to lie beyond the reach of human skill, that we meet with but few and imperfect notices of the St. Vintus dance in the second half of the 15th century. The highly coloured descriptions of the 16th century contradict the notion that this mental plague had in its any degree diminished in its severity, and not a single fact is to be found which supports the opinion that any one of the essential symptoms of the disease not even excepting the tympany, had disappeared, and that the disorder itself had become milder in its attacks. The physicians never, as it seems, throughout the whole of the fifteenth century undertook the treatment of the dancing mania, which, according to the prevailing notions, uh, appertained exclusively to the servants of the church. Against demonical disorders they had no remedies, and though some at first did promulgate the opinion that the malady had its origin in natural circumstances, 
such as a hot temper, and other causes named in the phraseology of the schools, yet these opinions were the less examined, as it did not appear worth while to divide with a jealous priesthood the care of a host of fanatical vagabonds and beggars. <laughs> A disease to be cured exclusively by the priests. Because the dudes affected didn't have money. That was the main issue. Since the rich dudes didn't get affected. Section 5. Physicians. It was not until the beginning of the 16th century that the St. Vitus dance was made the subject of medical research, and stripped of its unhallowed character as a work of demons. This was effected by Paracelsus, that mighty but as yet scarcely comprehended reformer of medicine, whose aim it was to withdraw disease from the pale and miraculous interpositions of saintly influences, and explain their causes by upon principles deduced from the knowledge of human frame. We will not, however, admit that the saints have power to inflict diseases, and that these ought to be named after them, although many uh, there are who, in their theology, lay great stress on this supposition, ascribing them rather to God than to nature, which is but idle talk. We dislike such nonsensical gossip as it is not supported by symptoms, but only by faith, a thing which is not human, whereupon the gods themselves set no value. Such were the words of Paracelsus addressed to his contemporaries, who were as yet incapable of appreciating doctrines of this sort for the belief in enchantment still remained everywhere unshaken, and faith in the world of the spirits still held man's minds. In so close a bondage, the thousands were, according to their own convictions, given up as prey to the devil, while as the command of religion as well as of law, countless piles were lighted by the flames of which human society was to be purified. Paracelsus devised that the St. Vitus dance in these three kinds, first, that which arises from imagination, vistisa, coria imaginativa aestimativa, by which the original dancing plague is to be understood, secondly, that which arises from sensual desires depending on the will, coria lasciva, thirdly, that which arises from corporeal causes, coria naturalis, which, according to a strange notion of his own, he explained by maintaining that in certain vessels which are susceptible of internal purency, and hence produce laughter, the blood is set in commotion, and in consequence of an alteration in the vital spirits, whereby involuntary fits of intoxicating joy and the propensity to dance are occasioned. To this notion he was no doubt led from having observed a mild form of St. Vitus's dance, not uncommon in his time, which was accompanied by involuntary laughter, and which bore a resemblance to the hysterical laughter of the moderns, except that it was characterized by more pleasurable sensations, and by an extravagant propensity to dance. There was no howling, screaming, and jumping, as in the severe form, neither was the disposal to dance by any means insuperable. Patients thus afflicted, although they had not a complete control over their understandings, yet were sufficiently self-possessed during the attack to obey the directions which they received. There were uh, even some amongst them who did not dance at all, but only felt a, an involuntary impulse to allay the intense sense of disquietude, which is the unusual forerunner of an attack of this kind, by laughter, 
and quick walking carried to the extent of producing fatigue. This disorder, so different from the original type, evidently approximates to the modern choleria, or rather is a in perfect accordance with it, even to the less essential symptoms of laughter. A mitigation in the form of dancing mania had thus clearly taken place at the commencement of the 16th century. On the communication of St. Vitus's dance by sympathy, Paracelsus, in his particular language, expressed himself with great spirit, and shows a profound knowledge of the nature of sensual impressions, which find their way to the heart, the seat of joys and emotions, which overpower the oppression of reason, and whilst all other qualities and natures are subdued, incessantly impel the patient in consequence of his original compliance and his all-conquering imagination to imitate that what he has seen. On his treatment of the disease, we cannot bestow any great praise, but we must consent with the remark that it was in conformity with the notions of the age in which he lived, for the first kind, which often originated in passionate excitement, he had a mental remedy, the efficacy of which is not to be despised. If we estimate its value in the connection with the prevalent opinions of those times, the patient was to make an image of himself in wax or resin, and by an effort of thought to concentrate all his blasphemies and sins in it, without the intervention of any other person, to set the, his whole mind and thoughts concerning these oaths in the image, and when he had succeeded in this, he was to burn the image, so that not a particle of it should remain. In all this there was no mention made of St. Vitus, or any other mandatory saints, which is accounted for by the circumference that in at this time an open rebellion against the Romish church had begun, and the worship of saints was by many rejected as idolatrous. For the second kind of St. Vitus's dance, arising from the sensual irritation, with which women were far more frequently affected than men, Paracelsus recommended harsh treatment and strict fasting. He directed that the patients should be deprived of their liberty, placed in solitary confinement, and made to sit in an uncomfortable place, until their misery brought them to their senses, and to a feeling of penitence. He then permitted them gradually to return to their accustomed habits. Severe corporeal chastisement was not omitted, but on the other hand, angry resistance on the part of the patients was to be Sedatory, uh, sedulostri, avoided. The hell is this? Yes, yes. Sedulous. Sedulously, okay. Involving or accomplished with careful perseverance. Okay. Sedulous. Sedulous. Interesting. Angry resistance on the part of the patient was to be sedulously avoided, on the ground that it might increase his malady and even destroy him. Moreover, there it seemed proper, Paracelsus allayed the excitement of the nerves by immersion in cold water. Ugh. Shivering. On the treatment of the third kind, we shall not here enlarge. It was to be effected by all sorts of wonderful remedies, composed of quintessence, and it would require to render it intelligible. A more extended exposition of particular principles that suits our present purpose. Do -do 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 -do. 
we are getting close to the end i guess because section six talks about the decline and termination of the dancing plague at this time the saint vitus dance began to decline so that milder forms of it appeared more frequently while the severer cases became more rare and even in these some of the more important symptoms gradually disappeared paracelsus makes no mention of the tempanies as making place after the attacks although it may occasionally have occurred and the schreck von grafenberg a celebrated physician of the latter half of the 16th century speaks of this disease as having been frequently frequented only in the time of his forefathers his descriptions however are applicable to the whole of that century and to the close of the 15th the saint vitus dance attacked people of all stations especially those who led a sedentary life oh boy better go up and take a walk <laughs> such as shoemakers and tailors all those people on computers back then but even the most robust peasants abandoned their labors in the fields as if they were possessed by evil spirits and thus those affected were seen assembling indiscriminately from time to time at certain appointed places and unless prevailed by the onlookers continued to dance without intermission until their very last breath was expanded their fury and extravagance of demeanor was so completely deprived them of their senses that many of them dashed their brains out against the ba dashed it's not bashed though it's dashed hmm. okay they dashed their brains out against the walls and corners of buildings or rushed headlong into rapid rivers where they found a watery grave roaming and foaming as they were the bystanders could only succeed in restraining them by placing branches and chairs in their way so that by the high leaps they were thus tempted to take their strength might be exhausted as soon as this was the case they fell as they were lifeless to the ground and by the very slow degrees again recovered their strength many there were whom even with all this exertion had not expanded the violence of the tempest which raged within them but awoke with the newly revived powers and again and again mixed with the crowd of dancers until at length the violent excitement of their disordered nerves was allayed by the great involuntary exertions of their limbs and the mental disorder was calmed by the extreme exhaustion of the body thus the attacks themselves were in these cases as in their nature there are all nervous complaints necessary crises of the inward morbid condition which was transferred from the sensorium to the nerves of motion and at an earlier period to the abnormal plexus where a deep-seated derangement of the system was perceived from the secretion of flatus in the intestines <laughs> the cure afflicted by these stormy attacks was in many cases so perfect that some patients returned to the factory or the plough as if nothing had happened others on the contrary paid the penalty of their folly by so total a loss of power that they could not regain their former health even by the employment of the most strengthening remedies medical men were astonished to observe that women in an advanced state of pregnancy were capable of going for an attack of the disease without the slightest injury to their offspring which they protected merely by a bondage pressed around their waist cases of this kind were not unfrequent so late as schleck's time the patients should so violently be affected by music and their paroxysms brought on and increased it by its natural with such nervous disorders their deeper impressions are made through the ear which is the most intellectual of all organs <laughs> Brilliant. 
that though any of the other senses then through um, any of the other senses <laughs> I, I was totally thrown off by the most intellectual organ the ear baby on this account the magistrates hired musicians for the purpose of carrying the saint vitus dancers so much the quicker through the attacks and directed that athletic men should be sent along them in order to complete the exhaustion which had been often observed to produce a good effect at the same time there was a prohibition against wearing red garments because at the sight of this color those affected became so furious that they flew at the person who wore them and were so bent upon doing them an injury that they could with difficulty be restrained they frequently tore their own clothes whilst in the paroxysm and wore guilty of other improprieties as that the more opulent employed confidential attendants to accompany them and to take care that they did not harm others this extraordinary disease was however so greatly mitigated in schleck's times that the St. Vitus dancers had long since ceased to stroll from town to town, and that physician like Paracelsus makes no mention of tympanic inflammation of the bowels. Moreover, most of these afflicted were only annually visited by, by attacks. An occasion of them was so manifestly ref refutable to the prevailing notions of that period that if the unqualified belief in the supernatural agency of saints could have been abolished, they would not have had any return of complaint. Throughout the whole of June, prior to the festival of St. John, patients fell of disquietude and the restlessness which they were unable to overcome. They were dejected, timid and anxious, wandered about in an unsettled state, being tormented by twitching pains which seized them suddenly in different parts and eagerly expected the eve of St. John's Day in the confident hope that by the dancing at the altars of this saint or the saint of St. Vitus, for in Bargau aid was equally sought for both, they would be freed from all their suffering. This hope was not disappointed and they remained for the rest of the year exempt from any further attack. After having thus, by dancing and raving for three hours, satisfied an irresistible demand of nature, there were at that period two chapels at Breslau, visited by the St. Vitus's dancers, namely the chapel of St. Vitus at Biesen, near Breichan, and that of St. John near Weissenweiler. And it was probable that in the southwest of Germany the disease was still in existence in the 17th century. <laughs> they were just dudes wanting to dance for a couple of hours. Come on. And only a couple of times a year, once a year, go dancing for a couple of hours. What's wrong with that? However, it grew every year more rare, so that, at the beginning of the 17th century, it was observed only occasionally in the ancient form. Thus, in the spring of the year of 1623, G. Horst saw some women who annually performed a pilgrimage to St. Vitius's chapel at Drosfen, Dreffenhausen, near Wensenshain, in the territory of Ulm, that they might wait for their dancing fit there, in the same manner of those in Breslau did, according to Schleck's account. They were not satisfied, however, with a dance of three hours' duration, but continued day and night in a state of mental aberration, like persons in ecstasy, until they fell exhausted to the ground, and when they came to themselves again, they felt relieved from a distressing uneasiness and painful sensation of weight in their bodies, of which they had complained for several weeks prior to St. Vitus' day. After the commotion, they remained well for the whole year, 
and such was their fate in the protective power of the saint that one of them had visited his shrine in Dreffenhesen more than twenty times, and another had already kept the saint's day for the thirtieth time at his sacred station. The dancing fit itself was excited here, as it's probable was in other places by music, from the effects of which the patients were thrown into a state of convulsion. Many concurrent testimonies serve to show that music generally contributed much to the continuance of the St. Vitius's dance, originated and increased in paroxysms, and was sometimes the cause of their mitigation. So early as the 14th century the swarms of St. John's dancers were accompanied by the minstrels playing upon noisy instruments who roused their morbid feelings, and it may readily be supposed that by performance of lively melodies and the stimulating effects which the shrill tones of fifes and trumpets would produce, a paroxysm that was perhaps but slight in itself might in many cases be increased to the most outrageous fury, such as in later times, was purposely induced in order that the force of the disease might be exhausted by the violence of its attack. Moreover, by means of intoxicating music, a kind of demonical festival of the rude multitude was established, which had the effect of spreading this unhappy melody wider and wider. Soft harmony was, however, employed to calm the excitement of those affected, and it's mentioned as a character of those tunes played with this view of the St. Vitus dancers, that they contained transitions from a quick to a slow measure. It is to be regarded that no trace of this music had reached our times, which is owing partially to the disastrous events of the 17th century and partially to the circumstance that a disorder was looked upon as entirely national and only incidentally considered worthy of notice by foreign men of learning. If the St. Vitus dance was already on the decline at the commencement of the 17th century, the subsequent events were altogether adverse to its continuance. Wars carried on with uh, animosity and with various successes of, uh, for thirty years shook the west of Europe and although the unspeakable calamities which they brought upon Germany, both during their continuance and in their immediate consequences, were by no means favourable to the advance of knowledge, yet, with the vehemence of a purifying fire, they gradually affected the intellectual regeneration of the Germans. Superstition, in her ancient form, never again appeared, and the belief in the domination of spirits which prevailed in the Middle Ages lost forever its once formidable power. So I guess this dude thinks it was superstition that made uh, these people die or such stuff. Anyway, our hour is over. The Dancing Mania has a couple of more chapters. If you're interested, you can look up this book. Uh, it's in the public domain. The Epidemics of the Middle Ages. The second chapter continues with Dancing Mania in Italy. 